one thing about uh, thinking about pastor's appreciation that I think God loved me and gave me one more hour today. That's the greatest gift. <laughs> First John chapter 2, verse 15. It says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. Amen. Let's pray that this portion of the scripture be open to us. Father, we praise you and thank you for this time. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your word. That so cuts us. Operates in us. Convicts us. And we pray that your word will be spoken today. May the Spirit of God stir within our hearts with your word so that our lives can be corrected and be whole. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are in the journey of 1 John, age of the apostle, is writing to his beloved disciples, people of God. And we find here the apostle resuming the list of practical injunctions and exhortations which he was giving to these people after having interrupted this list in order to remind them of the resources uh, that we talked about yeah, last week. That we are children of God. That we are young men. That we are fathers. That as we grow in our spirit, as we grow as Christians, that we have resources through God and the growth take place in our lives and we can obey Him. He is anxious that they should understand clearly that He is not ask, asking the impossible, nor is He raising the standard too high. Their sins are already, forgive, already forgiven them, and they have the strength and the power whereby they can overcome, and they know God and have fellowship with Him and the Lord Jesus Christ, so it is in the light of these things that he exhorts them in this way to put certain principles into practice. Now here in these verses are we have the great negative exhortation. Having told them what they are to do, he reminds, of, reminds them of something that they are to avoid. Love not the world. Uh, through the past few weeks as we talk about 1st John, we've been, one of the purpose of 1st uh, John is so that people will know that they have eternal life. And so whether you can check whether you are a believer in Jesus Christ or not, there are some things written in here so that we can check. And we talked about three things preceding weeks. And this is a fourth thing. If I were to uh, review those first few, first four, including today's text, is first of all, to know that you are saved in Jesus Christ. First thing that characterizes Christian is that he confesses his sins. He is convicted of his sins, sees his sins, and progressively he sees more of it, and that's why he more of it, he clings to the cross, he confesses his sins. Second sign of that is that he obeys the word of God. He obeys God, and he does what he says. Third is that, that he loves people that God loves. People, love for the people. And the fourth thing that we come to is that he hates the world. A group of first graders had just completed a tour of hospital and the nurse who had directed them was asking for questions and one hand just immediately was raised and he says, 
he asked this question. How come the people who work here are always washing their hands? After people laughed and the laugh subsided, the nurse gave a wise answer and said, they are, uh, they are always washing hands for two reasons. One, they love health. Two, they uh, hate germs. As you can see, in more than one areas in our lives, love and hate goes together, go hand in hand. A husband who loves his wife is certainly going to exercise a hatred for what would harm her. That's why scripture says, when you love God, you've got to hate some things. Psalm 97 verse 10, it says, You love the, world, love the Lord and hate evil. Romans 12, 9, it says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cleave to what is good. John, the epistles, reminds us that we need to love people, but we need to hate this world. And if you really love God, you cannot love this world. And that's what this text talks about. You can check within your heart, within your life, whether uh, you love God or you love this world. Two can, two, the two cannot go together. So we need to talk about this world. What in the world does it mean by world? We'll talk about three things. Definition of world. Definition of worldliness. Secondly, we will talk about lifestyle of worldliness. And then thirdly, we'll talk about the alternative lifestyle to worldliness. Okay, so definition of worldliness and the lifestyle of worldliness. Description of what this worldly lifestyle is about. And then the alternative. So first of all, let's define what the what the world is, what worldliness means. Now, what do, you, what do you think about when you think about the world? The world. Worldly. What, what does it mean by worldly? Uh, he is worldly or she is worldly. And that activity is worldly. What do you think about? Some people say smoking is worldly. Some people say drinking is worldly. Some people say dancing is worldly. Some people say, party is worldly. Some people, a certain hairstyle. Or no hairstyle is worldly. Some people say, earring. I didn't say that. Some people say, earring. I know a lot of our guys. <laughs> Some people say, certain type of music. Some people say, certain type of even Christian music. Some people say sports. I, I was so surprised when I went to Africa. Uh, I, was, I played basketball there. Ministry, it was a ministry, and I was playing basketball there, and then some of the pastors were so shocked that a pastor was playing sports because they thought it was worldly somehow. So I said, oh, I must be worldly pastor. Some people say certain books. Some time with non-Christian people, if you spend time with non-Christian people, that's worldly. Some people say, certain place, if you go to a certain place, that's, that's worldly. Some people say, certain vocation, certain job. Some people say, money, money is worldly. Some people say, dating is worldly, or something like that. Uh, if we really think about uh, these things, as we, we need to get to the scripture. When we look into the Bible, what worldliness is, is not, it didn't say thing worldly, uh, something, do not uh, love, uh, do not uh, be associated with the things in the world, but it says, notice verse 15, carefully, it says, do not love the world or anything in the world. So it's not really talking about things in the world, but the love of the world. Or love of the things in the world. So what is worldliness? Dodd put it this way. Commentator named Dodd. He said, uh, worldliness or, or the world is the life of human society as organized under the power of evil. Dodd said, the life of human society organized under the power of evil. So it's some kind of system that is organized under the power of Satan, power of evil. Westcott said this, 
the order of finite being, order of finite being, regarded as a part from God. So it's some kind of system, order of finite being, apart from God. Okay? And so we look into the scripture, John, is, John almost equates the world as darkness. As he contrasts light and darkness, he talks about the world, which is part of darkness. Okay? So, if we really think about it, this order or system against or apart from God has to do not externally, but internally. There's something to do with internally. Extern externality only manifests what exists internally, worldliness. So worldliness has to do with love of this world, the attitude that we have with this world. So when we say love, don't misunderstand, it is not an uncontrollable emotion as, as we think. Like if you, have, if you love this world, you have passionate uh, emotion toward this world. It's not just talking about that. It may include it, but it's not just talking about that. But the love, not just an uncontrollable emotion, but love is steady devotion of will. As we look into the scripture, love of this world talks about love, steady devotion of the will. So when Bible says, I love you, it's not just talking about this full out of heart, but steady devotion of the will. Love is commitment. It's steady devotion of will. So it says that love for this world, steady devotion of will to this world is something wrong. It is obviously, it is obvious that John is not thinking about the things in themselves such as money or possessions which are morally neutral. Rather, he is talking about our personal attitudes towards these things, love of this world. So the worldly characteristics of which the verse speaks are in fact reactions going on inside us as we contemplate the environment outside. This is very true of the scripture's teaching concerning fundamental roots of mankind's problem. You can put a human being in a most perfect and favorable and natural environment and he will spoil it and defile it. Why? Because of the sin resides within a heart. The reason is not because of deficiency in the environment, but because of what, go, what is going on inside of us. So as Lord Jesus puts it in Mark chapter 7, verse 20 through 23, Mark 7, 20 through 23, let me read it. It says, what comes out of man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, in envy, slander, arrogance, and folly, all these evils, system of this world, comes, in, uh, uh, comes from inside and makes a man unclean. No wonder Mark's, Mark Twain said, man is the only animal with the capacity to blush, and only one that needs to. <laughs> and it is important that we grasp this perspective, since Christians often have been content to define worldliness as consisting primarily in the things that people do or places they visit. But John is concerned to show us that the world affects us much more deeply than that. It affects our motives, attitudes, and minds and wills are ultimately dictate our actions. So our affections are set either on this world or on God. And it is impossible to love them both. So if I were to just summarize it in one sentence, <laughs> what uh, worldliness is, let me define it this way. And I'll explain this definition in the second point as I talk about lifestyle of worldliness. Is this. Definition of worldliness requires three things. Desires of flesh. State of mind. Passion of heart. So body, mind, and soul. Flesh, mind, and heart. Desires of the flesh. State of mind. Passion of heart. Here we go. That hinders our love for God and obedience to God. That hinders 
our love for God and obedience to God. That's worldliness. Let me read it again. Worldliness is desire of flesh, state of mind, what you think, and passion of heart, what you love. That hinders our love for God and obedience to God. That's what worldliness is. We define it like that. Now let's describe it a little bit. Let's second, secondly, let's go to the lifestyle of worldliness. This point, in this point, I'm going to talk about the lifestyle of worldliness, the characteristic of it. And then the next point, I'm going to talk about alternative to the lifestyle of worldliness. So what is, what is this lifestyle of worldliness? Characteristics of this worldliness. And I'm going to talk about these three things. Do you see something we have to understand is, is that it is Satan's strategy to use these three aspects. I'm going to talk about the three aspects as a lifestyle of worldliness, what worldliness means. That's exactly how Satan affects us in our lives. Satan has been attacking us ever since the beginning of history, as well as to the end, he will attack the same way, and we got to know our enemy. If you don't know your enemy, you're going to be demolished. Any war, you need to know your enemy, and if you know your enemy, you win. It's like this. One time a knight was was fighting a battle. He, he went out to fight the battle. He went out. And, you know, he was fighting as, as hard as he can. And he came back to the king. And he was sweating and bleeding. And king asked, what have you been doing? And I, and I said, I've been fighting a war. And he said, where did you go? I've been to the west fighting your enemy. And the king said, I don't have any enemy in the west. He goes, well, I guess now you do. What is the point of this? point is that a lot of times we don't know our enemies. A lot of times we don't know battle, where the battle takes place. And we think, oh, worldliness, this is worldly. And we're fighting the wrong places, fighting the wrong way. While the worldliness resides in your heart, in your mind, in your fleshly desire. And that's how Satan attacks you. And you fight in the wrong place. That's what this text talks about, worldliness. Okay, three lifestyles of worldliness. First lifestyle is a, described as cravings of sinful man. That's how Satan attacks us, through our cravings. That's worldliness. If we are to follow that cravings within, it talks about physical aspect in our lives. It talks about our natural appetites. Nothing wrong with our natural appetites. Like, for example, hunger. If you're hungry, nothing wrong. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm hungry, Lord. No, you don't have to repent your sins of being hungry. I'm hungry right now. I can eat a horse at this moment, but that's not a sin. But if you eat too much, it leads to gluttony. That's, that's sin. Okay? Craving of sinful man. Thirst is nothing wrong with thirst, but if you drink the wrong things as well as if you drink wrong amount of the things you drink, that's something wrong. Like if you drink alcohol ex and drink it excessively, become drunk. Nothing wrong with that thirst, but you drink the wrong things excessively, that's wrong. Sleeping, nothing wrong with desire to sleep when you're tired. That is, if you're sleeping one digit amount of hours, rather than two or three, maybe not three, but two, <laughs> hopefully not, two-digit amount of sleeping hours, that, that's laziness, that's sin, that's worldliness. Nothing wrong with money, but if you want, if you have greed in your heart, that is worldliness. Nothing wrong with sin, but if you, if it leads to immor, uh, nothing wrong with sex, but if it leads to immorality, you see, that's something wrong. That's worldliness. So nothing wrong with our natural appetites, but as long as it's within God's rules and God's limitation and within controlled access, nothing wrong with fulfilling your physical appetites. But problem is 
we want it at cost of breaking God's limitations and running to an uncontrollable excess, then it leads to misery, guilt. That's where sin comes in. So when you're, uh, so Satan knows your appetites and natural appetites and he attacks you that way. And when we live in that kind of outside of boundaries of God and controlled access, then it leads to sin. It leads to worldliness. There you are controlled by these things. You are controlled by these things rather than controlling it. There you are serving these things, not in dominion of these things. God told us to conquer and dom be in dominion of this world, not to, be uh, not to be ruled by these things. There you become slaves of your drive rather than slaves of your Holy Spirit. There you are serving yourself rather than living for the glory of God. Just to illustrate that, just talk about one, one of the drives since we've been talking about sex whole uh, weekend. That sounds interesting. That sounds, doesn't sound right, but we've been talking about the Friday, so just to talk, just to illustrate a little more about what sexual sex is. Sex is supposed to be enjoyed within lifelong marriage. Expression of committed affection. That's what love is about. That's what sex is about. But if you, if mere mechanics of sex, sexual activity, takes place without marriage, without affection, love, and commitment, it leads to guilt, delusion. It's not enjoyable. There's emptiness. But only within the boundary of marriage, love and commitment. God has made it like that. So if you have sexual relationship without commitment, without marriage, there's always emptiness. You can't really enjoy it except for a few seconds and there's gross guilt that comes afterwards because God made it like that and you're using it. You're misusing what God has given you as a gift. But you're going out of boundary of what God has said. So if we fulfill these physical appetites in our lives, or if, you feel, if you enjoy this physical appetites out of the boundary of God is like drinking salt water. Think about that. Let's say you're living in an ocean and you're thirsty all the time. There's nothing else to drink except the salt water. So you're so thirsty, so you drink it. And you drink it and temporarily you're satisfied. It doesn't taste good, but at least your thirst is gone for a few seconds, maybe a few minutes, I don't know. But you're more thirsty and you drink it and drink it and ultimately you are destroyed and you die. But the thing is, that's how life is without Jesus Christ. Unless He gives us a living water that will quench our thirst of our heart. All you're doing is drinking salt water. Temporarily you might be satisfied in fulfilling your physical appetites, but you get hungry for more, ultimately it will lead to death. That's what worldliness does to our lives. Second, lifestyle of worldliness, not only uh, cravings of sinful men, but lust of the eyes. Not only does Satan attack us through the cravings that we have, so that we will go out of the boundary of God, so that we will enjoy these things and desire for these things excessively, but also He attacks us through the lust of our eyes. And when we live in that kind of mindset, lust, uh, living with the lust of our eyes, then not only do we lose our battles with Satan, that's worldliness that, that will destroy us. Lust of the eyes, if cravings of sinful men has to do with physical, lust of the eyes has to do with our minds. We see things and our minds are stimulated. It's like a window to uh, the cravings 
within with inside of us. How does Satan attack us uh, inside of us? The cravings, how does he stimulate us? Through the lust of our eyes. Has to do with our mindset, has to do with our minds. It's a window to and bridge to our minds. You see? And see, uh, there's a problem of pleasure oriented society in this world. Since this, this society is so rich, we have abundance in everything, we don't really have to spend time in working to live so for a survival basis. So we have a lot of time. We don't really have to work all day. We don't really have to pray, give us this day our daily bread. But at the time, at, uh, when the Bible was written, a lot of people had to pray like that. So every day they need to depend on God, and that's what they need to spend their energy in. And they were busy in that sense. But now we are busy not so that we can survive, a little bit maybe, but not really. But most of the times we are busy because of our, to fulfill our pleasure. Okay? You think you're busy, but really analyze the time you have. Do you really need that much time to eat? Do you really need that much time to go to the bathroom? Do you really need that much time for entertainment, to rest and all these things? No. We really waste a lot of time fulfilling our pleasure. And when that happens, we have so much time, we live in this pleasure-oriented society just to meet our eyes' lusts that we have within. And that becomes problem. It talks, Satan attacks in this society. Just look around everywhere. We can easily have lust for things, lust for food, lust for opposite uh, genders or whatever it is, lust for this world and money and the pleasure of the society. It has to do with our minds and our mindsets. What we need to realize is that this world uh, which Satan is behind cannot produce what it offers. Only God can. Its attractions are fundamentally deceptive. Just like when Achan saw Babylonian robes, he could not resist. Just as when David saw a bathing woman, he could not resist. And whatever we see has to do with our mindset. Whatever we see when, we are, when our minds are attacked, we go for the lust that we have within. But you see, if you do that, you are like a goldfish out of fish tank. Let's say goldfish is living in a fish tank and he goes, I'm sick and tired of living in this fish tank. Why in the world do I have to live in this stinky little fish tank while people are walking around? I'm going to go out and he jumps out. And he's not going to last an hour. And he's going to die. That's what living in worldliness is like. God has set boundaries to everything that we have and everything that we can do. But when we go out of the boundary, it will destroy us. It will lead to death. Third ways, third lifestyle of worldliness, which Satan attacks through us, uh, to us, through is pride of life or according to NIV translation, the boasting of what he has and does, has to do with our heart. If cravings of simple men has to do with physical aspect, lust of the eyes has to do with mind, pride of life has to do with ourselves, our heart, our spirit, that we want to exalt ourselves. The word pride means empty display of life. Pride means vain boasting of one's lifestyle. Pride means living to impress people. You know, the people who talk about themselves all the time, whether talk lowly of themselves or very highly of themselves, it has to do with themselves somehow to exalt themselves. Or even talking about other people, degrading other people, so that somehow you can exalt yourself. And a lot of times when we think about ourselves, we use the things that God has given us, resources and the things that God has given us. We use these things that God has given us to glorify Him and honor Him as stewards, but we use these things that God has given us to glorify ourselves and exalt ourselves. You say, no, I don't do that. Yes, you do. Myself as well. Just a good illustration. Just one simple thing is that why in the world did you wear nice clothes today? So that it will really show your heart attitude 
to in preparation before God? I don't think so. You want to look good to others. That's why you wear nice clothes. I think that's why I wore a suit today. I could be wearing t-shirt and nothing wrong with that. If that is your best clothes. But thing is, I'm wearing suit so that I can look nice to you. Not that I can get a wife or anything, I already have one. But <laughs> some of you are wearing nice clothes. Really, seriously, think about it. That's a worldly mindset. That's why I'm asking you, as well as myself, to check our thoughts all the time. Test what you think, intention and motive. Is it worldly thought? We need to bring every thought captive to Christ. If you allow small, little things to come into your minds, you're not going to be able to stop the more difficult things that will come into your lives. We need to start from the little things. Even when we uh, talk and all these things, we act, we talk so that we will have one up in our conversation. Uh, I got to confess, one time I borrowed Mercedes Benz from somebody. <laughs> I was just driving it. And uh, another time, uh, Maz, is it Maserati or something like that, car like that. I was working at a gas station. I had to move from here to there. As I was driving, it felt pretty good. And I was thinking, why in the world do I feel pretty good driving this? Because people look at me. And I enjoy that feeling. Pride of life. Oh, it wasn't even my car. I felt good. Why? Because I'm acting like an owner. But doesn't Bible say everything is given by God? All that we are and all that we have is God's, but we act like it's ours. Your degree, amount of money you get from your jobs, amount of money you get from your jobs, is nothing to be boastful about. But these people do that. You act like owner, act like an owner rather than a steward. Right? Pride of life, boasting of what he has and does, and we live in that philosophy. Why in the world do you study? Why do you always say to people, I graduated from University of Illinois? Or, I attend University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, I go to CFC, or I live in Chicago. Bulls country. Why do you identify with certain groups or certain person? I know this person. I'm in this Bible study. Pride of life, isn't it? I want to relate those three things. Cra cravings of sinful men, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Relating those things to a lot of things now. Just see how Satan works. I pray that you will have a big picture of how Satan is working in this world, in your lives. Just think a little bit. He has been working in this manner, in this, using this method ever since the fall of Adam and Eve. And he will work like this in this, using these three aspects of worldliness till the day Jesus comes. Thinking, thinking about Adam and Eve, how, how did Satan come to Eve? Satan came to Eve. Woman. Concerning food. And when she looked pleasing to the eye, It was concerning food, physical appetite, designed for gaining wisdom so that she can be like God, exalting herself. Three aspects touched right there. Right? Small note that has nothing to do with this. I noticed it was a woman. Food. Particular food was fruit. <laughs> Just a little note there. No theological connection there, but it was very interesting. I thought about that. Very interesting. Satan's tactic is the same today. Right? Attacks are physical, 
aspect of our lives, mind, our minds, and our spiritual realm, our exaltation of ourselves. He attacks our basic desire, physical, base desire. He attacks our minds, giving false values. Attacks our spirit, egotism. Base desire, false values, egotism. That's how Satan attacks. How did Satan come and attack? Okay? When he, when he came to Eve. Think about it. Has to do with physical appetite. Stimulating senses. Look. And then what did he do? He attacked the word of God. Something to do with mind. Attack the word of God. Did God really say? God said, don't eat the fruit of good and evil. Satan comes and attacks her mind. See, did God really say? But when you attack God's word, what are you really attacking? You're attacking God himself. That person, can you believe that person said, what are you really attacking? You're attacking that person's character. So by attacking God's word, she's, Satan is really attacking God and his character, degrading God. So that if you degrade God, what happens is that you have desire to exalt yourself. If you have desire to exalt God, you don't even want to exist. You want to, you want to exalt God and worship Him. Either you exalt God or you exalt yourself. And thing is, if you start to degrade God, you start to exalt yourself. And she wanted to gain the wisdom so that she'll be like God. You can see how Satan works in the same way in this world. Thinking about the history, thinking about the philosophy, thinking about the world system, think about it. Physical aspect, through hedonism, playboy philosophy, consumerism, all the commercials, if you think about all the commercials that you watch, they want you to satisfy your physical nature, basic desires, rather than be in, in control of our senses, of our physical desires. Think about how the Satan attacks our minds, intellectualism, philosophies of this world, science, that we can reason away everything. Evolution, all these things, we can reason away these things. We can know everything. And then thinking about our spiritual aspect, cult, spiritism, new age, other religion, Muslims, exaltation of something else than God. Ultimately yourself. And Bible says the world passes away. That's how Satan attacks. We need to think. We need to check. We need to look at ourselves. Is there any unbiblical thoughts in our minds that has affected my desire? So I want to boast myself. Pride in what I have, what I do. We need to be always in check. Otherwise you're going to fall. We talked about lifestyle of worldliness. Let's go to the third point of the message, which is, okay, if that's worldliness, if that kind of desire within me, and I'm, if I'm living according to that and living for that is worldliness, then what is the ultimate uh, uh, alternative lifestyle to worldliness? Alternative lifestyle to worldliness is, of course, godliness. What is godliness? Verse 17 talks about that the world and its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. Look at the sentence. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. It mentions three things that will last in eternity. God, His will, His man. Three things that will last forever. God, His Word, and His people. That will last forever. Those are the worthwhile things that we need to invest in in our lives. That's the alternative lifestyle. How does Satan attack us in this world? Think about it. How does Satan attack us in this world? He attacks our inside. He attacks our minds. He attacks our desires. Using the things of this world, He attacks within. He wants to put the foot in the door of our hearts and minds so that we, are affect, we will be affected by these fleshly desires and thoughts and exaltation of ourselves within us so that we will be imp impotent people. 
He wants to lead our hearts astray from God. That's why he says, do not love the world or things in the world, but rather love God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength, physical, mental, spiritual, all aspects. You need to love God rather than loving the world. And if you love the world, you cannot love God. And we need to see ourselves. How are we living? How am I? How's my thought life? I used to criticize some of your parents for saying, become lawyer, become doctor. And I used to say, how secular that is. But then again, I'm telling my children, don't be doctor, don't be lawyer, be a pastor. That's worldly too. Because I want them to become what I want them to be. That's my, I think, fleshly desire for them to become what I want them to become rather than what God wants them to become. Is it biblical for me to say to them, you got to become a full-time minister? That's my secret desire. I don't want them to become a doctor or lawyer. I'll be disappointed, I think. Sorry if there's doctors and lawyers here. There was some in the last service, but maybe not here. That's my secret desire, but that's my fleshly desire. They got to become what God wants them to become. We need to really check our thoughts and add it to our minds. We need to have, in terms of our fleshly desires, we need to check. Okay? Is there any desire within me that is not under control of God? That I'm controlled by these things? That my passion is led away? Every time you are not passionate for God, you are passionate. I mean, every single one of us, we are passionate about something. Don't say, I'm not a passionate person. Yes, you are. You are, every single one of us are passionate about something. And if you're not passionate about God, you're passionate about something else. There's something, if I were to point out, if anybody were to point out something in your heart, you have, some, you have passion about something. If it's not about God, you're passionate about something else at this moment. Everybody is passionate about something. That means our hearts are led away, astray to something, probably something to do with worldliness. Is my desire under control? Is my minds and thoughts under control? If I say these things, is that biblical? If my friend says this thing, is this biblical? If my friend says, let's go to this thing, if, is it biblical? You need to check your thoughts, whether every thought that you have are biblical. When you say something, when you think something, always learn how to think biblically. When you watch something, when you see a commercial, when you see a movie, always, movies always think. There's no neutral entertainment, people, because it feeds your minds and it feeds your desires. And unless you discern, our minds and thoughts and our hearts become worldly and are less, led astray and we become impotent. That leads our hearts away from God. And that's how Satan attacks us. Satan's tactic divides our focus and attention and devotion away from God so that we can love the world, not love God. We need to love God. Love there means your devotion in, faith in, trust in, belief in, commitment in God. Because if we don't what are not careful of our hearts, we will exalt ourselves rather than God. If we are not careful of ourselves, in, in our minds, our eyes will be led astray and look at other things rather than the scripture. And if we are not be careful in our, uh, in our fleshly desires, we will not love God with all of our strength. You know, just talking to some people, graduates recently, as well as going to other places, I'm pretty convinced people who are such, of course, much better listener than other places, other campuses. And I feel like other churches. I feel like you are very good listener, listeners in terms of externally. At least you look like you're listening. At least you think you're listening. I'm convinced that not many people are listening. I don't mean you're not listening with your ears and minds. You are listening. 
but you really don't listen. You just don't get it. I'm convinced of that. May I remind you, only thing you're going to carry out of here is your relationship with God. What you hold on to in the Word of God, that is your life. Recently, as I told you, I went to uh, Berkeley campus, and there, out of the blue, this, there was this guy sitting, whom I knew ever since I was in college, and he was, uh, when I was in Alpha and Omega ministry, he was there in the pews at different places, and, uh, in a, and, and he himself was in a band somewhere, it's not Alpha Omega Gospel, but somewhere else. some other band, and he was a Bible study leader of a campus and, a, and an officer. I mean, God used him. God used him tremendously. And I think he had much higher spiritual standard than maybe a lot of you. And he, he was there when I was preaching there, and I was so happy to see him. After we had a good revival, he said, uh, how you doing? And, He said, can I talk to you privately? So we went inside to a room to talk in private. And he basically said that, you know, he remembers how God used him and all these things. And he's, he said this, when I see you, it reminds me of, it reminds me, it reminds me of what I wanted to be. what I always wanted to be. Meaning, he doesn't, re I mean, he doesn't mean like he wanted to be like me, but he, what he means is, is like, I'm like an old record. That when he uh, hears this old record, you think of all those times that you were, the place you were listening to 10 years ago or something like that. When he saw me, he remembered all the commitment that he made before God and how God used him, how, how much he used to love God. But now at this moment, he so much led astray. And uh, basically, I was talking to him. He has a fantastic job. He's getting calculated. In, he was getting about 20 times more than me. That's pride of life, though. You know, how much you're getting is pride of life. You're just steward of God. He was, getting, he was doing well in a society. But he said his heart is so led astray that he almost wants to, be, wants to quit. in his Christian life. He's not even sure whether he's a Christian or not. So we basically talked, we hugged, and we cried together. I just, it brought, brought within me a lot of memories as well. And I basically told him, you have a, you're in a crossroad. I don't know if God will give, always give you a chance, but God certainly brought you here to this revival meeting. to meet, meet me, we can pray together, and I believe God is giving you one more chance. I don't know if he'll give you two chances or three chances. It's not always he gives you chances, but he's giving you a chance today. You take it, and if you choose the right path to live for God in his word for his people, I want to see you faithful to the day you die. And we pray together, we separate it. I don't know if he'll be faithful or not. even just talking to some graduates, people who were faithful in this church, people who were Bible study leaders, officers, I don't care what they were. It's tough to live in this world. And I'm not only convinced not many people really listen. It's pretty depressing. I saw it. I'm pretty depressed these days. Uh, people have been sending cards and thank you for the cards and pastor's appreciation week and all these things. But as I always say, if I see you be faithful when you get out of here, you're faithfully serving the Lord. That means more than a thousand cards you write. What do I have to do to make you really listen and take it in your heart, the word of God? and live for him. If you tell me, I'll do anything.
but it's so difficult to do that. As long as I'm in this pulpit, as long as you're sitting in these pews, I'll pray that you'll be faithful to the Lord. Peter Mill, under the picture of this man in this church, is written these words under his picture, this pastor. It says that when he came as a pastor, there was no light. When he died, there was no darkness. I pray that every single one of you will go out, live, and win, and conquer the world for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Let me ask you not, not to just, just bluntly, honestly, do you know God? Do you have relationship with God? Do you really believe in God and love Him and do you hold on to His truth? Do you have devotion to God? Do you love God? Do you really listen? Or is your heart, mind, and soul filled with worldliness? Do you really take in the word of God? Will you really make a commitment to be faithful for life? I really don't know how many of you are saved. All the desire that is in my heart is that I want to see every single one of you there when we stand before God. Being faithful to the Lord to the point of death. I don't know what it is. But when I see my dear brothers and sisters get out of here, when the rubber meets the road, by seeing the result of their lives, I can tell whether they li really listen to God's word or not. My brothers and sisters, beloved, Listen to God's word. Open your heart to God. You check your relationship with God. Really be sure whether you're Christian or not. Because that's the only thing you're going to hold on to. That's the only thing you're going to get out of here with. Your relationship with God. It's you and God carrying you across daily. I cannot carry for you. Your cross, you and God. Denying yourself, your fleshly desire, your lust of the eye, your pride of life. You and God. You. No one else can do that for you. I wish I can. I can do it temporarily for you. I wish I can, but I can't. You and God. You check yourself. And please do examine yourselves while you can. See if you are living for God according to His, His will, serving His people. Please pray for a few minutes, examine yourselves.